Good evening. I'm Todd Fanzler, and on behalf of Bethel Lutheran Church's Caring for Creation and Caring for Social Justice groups, I'm delighted to welcome you to this Zoom webinar on preventing the next pandemic. We apologize, though, for the confusion about the starting time of tonight's event. Since, however, quite a few people registered today via the Bethel Daily Devotion, which gave the starting time at 7.30, we've decided to wait until now to begin. And if you attempted to join us at 7, thanks for your patience. And again, please accept our apology. However ineptly we've begun, this is the first in a series of Caring for Creation events over the course of the next several months that will feature outstanding guest speakers on topics ranging from global, like extreme weather, to local, like Dane County's Climate Action Plan. The centerpiece of tonight's event is a presentation by Professor Jonathan Patz, who is widely recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on public health. His talk was originally given at the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, hosted by the Nelson Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As our country struggles with the second wave of COVID infections, his presentation is every bit as relevant tonight as it was in April. And we're grateful to Jonathan and the Nelson Institute for their warm support of this evening's webinar. Dr. Pats is a physician and an environmental health researcher at UW-Madison, where he is a chaired professor and directs the Global Health Institute. For 15 years, he served as a lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the organization that shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. One of his collaborators was Bethel's own Professor John Kutzbach, who's also with us tonight. And you can be an active part of our webinar by submitting questions and comments during the video presentation which lasts about 35 minutes. To send a comment or question, just use the chat feature of Zoom. On my computer screen, there's a chat button that you can click at the bottom center of the screen. The chat button might be somewhere else on your screen though, so do look for it if you don't see it at the bottom center. We'll collate viewers' questions for our expert hosts Professors Greg Moses and Craig Jurdy to respond to after the video. And here they are to introduce themselves and our video presentation. Greg? Thanks, Todd. I'm Greg Moses, a retired nuclear engineering professor from UW-Madison. Since the start of this pandemic, I have been studying the physical mechanisms of the coronavirus transmission from person to person and the mathematical modeling of the pandemic spread through populations. Craig? And I'm Craig Jurdy. I'm a retired professor of medical education in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. For some years, I was pleased to work with Dr. Patz in the Global Health Program. That program arranged for students to travel abroad to study health and environmental issues. So remember, as you watch the video, to submit your questions and comments about the presentation, about the spread of the virus, and about Bethel's responses during this epidemic. Thank you. And now, here's Dr. Patz's presentation. With that, my goal today is to really focus on preventing the next pandemic. And this cover image, by the way, uh, has this image of, uh, of mass health workers and a burning forest has some very uh, special meaning for me. This was aired, this is an NBC special report aired two weeks ago, where in that they interviewed my former student, Amy Vitor, and talked about our study from the Amazon looking at the link between deforestation and malaria. 
but more on that later. We've known for a long time uh, the links between the environment and disease emergence. So it's not any news to, to this community. Uh, so today what I want to do is look at our current situation and I want to have three focus areas, the first being on the proximate socio-environmental determinants of the newly emerged coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which is now causing the COVID-19 pandemic. Secondly, the upstream causal factors, human incursion into and disruption of nature. And the last focus area is the urgency for a planetary health framework to prevent the next pandemic and even more extensive human suffering. So the first focus area, the proximate determinants of this novel coronavirus. Here you can see an image of uh, boys working on, um, you know, they're skinning a wild animal. You can see close contact and easy opportunity for cross-species transmission. And we've all heard about these Chinese wet markets. There's actually, in China, wildlife is a natural resource. There's a wildlife protection law that's led to a domesticated wildlife industry, especially geared for small-scale farmers, um, peasant farmers. But when you stack wildlife up in this situation, it creates an unnatural environment for pathogens pathogens to spill over from one species to the other. And I'll talk, I'll define and talk about spillover uh, very soon. But this is the near-term causal uh, emergence of this novel coronavirus out of the wet markets. Where does coronavirus come from in the wild? Uh, bats are the natural reservoir for SARS-like coronaviruses. And it's very important to understand the emergence of this last uh, coronavirus. It was not by um, human intervention. Uh, for example, genetic studies of this virus show the mutations uh, do, they definitely are not from human engineered um, manipulation. So it did not come from a laboratory. The mutations show evolutionary changes that are very consistent with cross-species transfer. And so when you have the bat virus come into contact with one of the most widely sold and endangered species from the legal picture of the pangolin, uh, it's, it's believed right now, the leading theory is that a bat coronavirus mixed with a pangolin coronavirus to lead to the current situation that we have right now. And unfortunately, you see this beautiful picture of a pangolin, but this is not a beautiful picture when you see this illegal wildlife trade. Apparently, they use the scales for med medicinal reasons, and there is no actual scientific evidence that they really help with anything. But this is the unfortunate situation we're in. So let's go to ground zero. Uh, this is the seafood market in Wuhan, China. They were selling live wildlife and livestock along with fish. Uh, you had the spillover of, of these uh, viruses, which we'll talk about shortly. And of course, from that location, you can see this, um, this map from, uh, this is software from the EcoHealth Alliance, uh, looking at flight paths for one week in January, and you can see that the virus spread around the world from international travel, and we all know the rest of the story. I will point out right here that most, from genetic analysis, most of the uh, coronavirus in the United States looks like it actually came from Europe. So flights from Europe into New York and Chicago, uh, as opposed to more of a China West Coast route. So that was the, you know, the, the near term, more obvious emergence of why we have this new coronavirus. Let's go upstream a little bit. Let's talk about the upstream causal factors, human incursions into and disruption of nature. 
And I saw this op-ed, I love the image of, uh, you know, the forbidden fruit, and it's, uh, I like the title as well, what the coronavirus pandemic tells us about our relationship with the natural world. Of course, for us in Wisconsin, this is really old news. If we go back to out of Leopold, um, professor at Wisconsin and government, uh, and served in the government as well, he came up with the concept of the land ethic. You know, when you look at a species or an individual, its health depends on the health of the land around it. So this already in his, his famous book, A Sand County, County Almanac and the Land Ethic, where he's talking about interlinkage between healthy ecosystems and the health of species on which they depend. And of course, the famous naturalist John Muir, we can sort of claim him, the Scottish, Wisconsin, California, Naturalist John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And the interconnectedness of all of this is so uh, front and center. So there are reports uh, linking ecosystems, environmental sustainability, and human health. These are, uh, I'm just going to show three of the reports that I have been involved with. This is the Millennium Ecosystem report, Ecosystems and Human Well-Being. Uh, Obama asked for a report from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, the PCAST, in this report titled Sustaining Environmental Capital, Protecting Society and the Economy. And of course, the World Health Organization has come out with a report, Our Planet, Our Health, Our Future, looking at human health linked to biodiversity, climate change, and desertification. And something familiar to most of you on the line, you know, that we've entered this new epoch. You know, we're in the era of the Anthropocene, where humans are touching every part of the planet. And you can see, you know, these rates, you know, accelerating rates of, of uh, greenhouse gases, CO2, deforestation, biodiversity loss, pollution, have been accelerating since the 1950s. So we're in this Anthropocene where we're really having an impact around the world. Land use change is, most, is probably the biggest cause of disease emergence. Uh, it's also the biggest threat to conservation and it's a major driver of climate change. It drives economic growth, but there are trade-offs and that's a problem. Uh, and you see emergence of diseases like malaria, Ebola virus. I'll talk later about Hendra virus. And of course, now we're, we have this virus COVID-2 that's causing the COVID-19. Again, this is not, we published on this 60 years ago in a paper called Unhealthy Landscapes and went over how land use change is affecting uh, disease emergence around the world. And there are different types of land use change. This is looking at drivers and locations of emergence events for zoonotic infectious diseases. Zoonotic means uh, uh, coming from animals, mostly wildlife, uh, but also domestic uh, animals. So animal to human zoonotic diseases from 1940 to 2005. Uh, this paper uh, published in Nature uh, points out um, the different types of land use change. You can see the, the green um, and the yellow are all related to uh, land use, agricultural intensification, and the food industry. Uh, you can see uh, bushmeat hunting in, in the red and, and war. And you can see in parts of Africa, it's, it's uh, war-related. Uh, also, this is this is other, and a lot of that other involves um, international travel, but also climate change. So it looks like sub-Saharan Africa, you've got issues of war, climate change, and bushmeat hunting. Whereas in other parts of the world, the greens and yellow show uh, deforestation and agricultural um, aspects of land use change. Um, of course, anti antimicrobial agents uh, in food supplies. Uh, that's also an issue that's problematic. So you can see these different types of um, drivers, and they, they differ around the world. 
But this is key to understand that these are how we're uh, disrupting Earth's natural systems is, in fact, presenting risks through disease emergence. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Peter Tasik, who's the director of the EcoHealth Alliance, he uh, had this wonderful quote. I'll just read it. The pandemics are on the rise, and we need to contain the process that drives them, not just the individual diseases. Plagues are not only part of our culture, they are caused by it. Great quote from Peter Daschet. So I want to go um, even, even further as far as looking at this exchange between uh, pathogens between animals and people. Uh, this uh, is looking at a gel electrophoresis that sort of uh, it, it looks at DNA. Uh, and this is blood from African bushmeat hunters. Uh, and there is similarity between the, the what they find in their own blood and what they find in non-human primates that they're hunting. And this dates back almost 20 years of a study showing that the majority of newly emerging diseases in humans are actually zoonoses stemming from animals. Now this next slide is probably the most important slide in this, this uh, focus area of upstream determinants of emerging diseases. This comes from a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Raina Plowright. And what I want you to notice, I want you to go, I'm going to go through these steps. And all of these things need to come into alignment in order for there to be a spillover event. And it's demonstrated by that blue bolt. And it's a rare event that happens. But it does happen when these all line up. When you look at the top, reservoir host distribution. Think about when we deforest and we disrupt habitats. You know, uh, reservoir species that may contain pathogens are forced to move. Uh, and then if, they, if we in, encroach more, encroach more on their habitat, there may be an increase in wildlife density, the reservoirs that are carrying these parasites and viruses become high, higher density, which then affects the amount of pathogen. When you have more dense wildlife, there's more transmission, and the abundance, the prevalence of the pathogen increases. And we can talk about infection intensity when that happens. And then, you know, the reservoir hosts that are carrying these diseases will shed them more, you know, so pathogen release into the environment. Do the pathogens then survive? Do they spread? And lastly, or, or near lastly, are humans exposed to those pathogens? So the contact, you know, the edge effect between forest fragments and villages or people going out into uh, for bushmeat hunting or other practices, you know, the humor, human exposure. And then are there barriers? Will that virus actually attach to a human cell? And that's where mutations and the recombination and why the wet markets, when you combine across species and have mutations, maybe the protein that wouldn't normally uh, affect, uh, attach to a human cell, there's a mutation. And so a bat virus or a pangolin virus or some other animal virus can then change and then attack humans. So there are all sorts of things that have to line up. And when they do line up, you see this spillover event and you have animal uh, pathogens that get into humans. And then if there's human to human spread, then we have a pandemic. So this is really important. And you can see how dealing with reservoir host distribution and density that's a habitat issue. That's climate and deforestation and disrupting natural systems that is at the front end of this problem. And this is an example of different diseases um, and how far they get. Uh, you know, so for example, rabies, an infected animal that you know bites a human. That's secondary. That's stage two as far as animal to human. Uh, spillover. Stage three is when an animal may infect a human that 
infects another human, but it's limited. It's a limited outbreak, uh, like SARS uh, and the Middle East uh, res uh, respiratory syndrome. Um, human human transmission after animal to human transmission, but didn't go very far. And then stage four, you have a long outbreak. So COVID-19, definitely we have, you know, animal to human and now massive human to human uh, infection, which is leading to a pandemic. If this is sustained over many years, then it becomes a stage five um, spillover event where it's only in humans like HIV AIDS, it came from non-human primates and also smallpox. So you can see these different levels of spillover. Um, and right now, COVID-19, it looks like it's gonna be here for a while, um, but you can get, understand this importance uh, when you look at nature and species and spillover events. You can also get spill back of humans infecting gorillas, for example, this is what Tony Goldberg works on. Uh, this is actually a picture of my colleague, uh, Dr. Professor Raina Plowright, and she's famous for her work on Hendra virus, a bat-borne virus in Australia. There were headlines, uh, lots of horses were dying uh, during this epidemic, and humans were also infected as well. The ecology is that the bats were roosting in trees and they would be eating fruit, which would drop on the ground and the horses would pick that up and get infected. And some of the horse handlers would then also get infected as well. Um, Dr. Plowright's study found that it was widespread deforestation and fires across Indonesia that disrupted bat migration and increased bat density in urban parks and places where horses are found as well, horse paddocks. And these relationships um, have been known for a while. Um, veterinarians uh, have um, taken a lead on this One Health movement. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a framework to really understand these interlinkages between humans, domestic animals, and wildlife, and also the environment around that. So this is a very holistic approach that has been helping us understand these interlinkages. So One Health is something uh, very high priority and it's really an, an important uh, effort as we move forward to, to really embrace the interdependence of these areas. One more example, uh, another bat-borne virus, uh, Nipah virus. Uh, one of our past students, Dr. Micah Hahn, a Nelson graduate and also Department of Population Health Sciences, did her thesis on um, this involves babies to collect sap. You can see uh, the picture in the lower right uh, pouring date palm. And this picture is um, in the upper right is fruit bats. So what do you think the connection is between you know, tapping date palms and drinking the date palm sap and fruit bats? Well, this is a nighttime image. You can see the fruit bat feeding right out of the pot that's collecting the date, date sap. So, of course, they're now trying to cover those so this doesn't happen, but that was the link. And what uh, Micah found in her study was that the area that was unique to Nipah virus in Bangladesh actually had more fragmented forest, higher human density, and more active bat roost. So again, an ecology, a disruption of the forest, an interplay between humans and a disrupt, disturbed environment leading to this outbreak of Nipah virus. But we've also worked uh, in the Peruvian Amazon, and this is an image showing deforestation in the light green but also now you can look at paved and unpaid roads and fires. Uh, we've, we've studied uh, what does that mean as far as disease risk. We've looked at malaria and deforestation. Malaria emerged in the Amazon uh, following a rapid deforestation uh, several decades ago. 
uh, we looked at different levels of deforestation in the Peruvian Amazon. And we collected, this is a work from Dr. Amy Vitor, who was featured in the cover image of this whole presentation. Uh, Dr. Amy Vitor led this study where she captured the dangerous mosquito, Anopheles darlingi, that carries malaria in that area. And after controlling for human population density, we found an increase in the abundance and biting of this dangerous mosquito. A subsequent uh, student of, of the University of Wisconsin, the Department of Population Health Sciences and the Nelson Institute, Dr. Sarah Olson, followed up on this study and found that for every 1% of deforestation, the incidence rate or the new cases of malaria increased by 11%. So we also have problems with climate change, and I want to talk about a little bit about climate change risks to the environment. These are the physical attributes of climate change, rising temperatures, sea level rise, and extremes of the water cycle, more droughts, floods, and fires. And of course, throughout, if you look at those three parameters, they cut across these different exposure pathways that lead to all of these different climate-sensitive diseases. And this lecture is not about climate change and health. I've given that one many, many times. But I do want to point out that part of the story of climate change and health is that of infectious diseases, especially insect and rodent-borne diseases, or vector-borne diseases, and waterborne diseases. And it is thought that global warming's greatest threat may also be the smallest, because that mosquito is a cold-blooded animal. And Whatever the air temperature is surrounding that mosquito, that is her body temperature. And if she's carrying dangerous parasites, the air temperature completely dictates the rate of development and biting rates as well. And so climate has a huge influence on transmission dynamics of these insect-borne diseases. Now, this uh, mosquito species, the Aedes aegypti, is the species that carries yellow fever, dengue, and Zika virus. Uh, dengue fever is the most prevalent uh, mosquito-borne virus in the world. And it's, it's, comes in, uh, it's seasonal, it comes in different seasons. And uh, working with my colleague, uh, Dan Weimont in the Nelson Institute Center for Climatic Research, I asked him to take a look at temperatures in South America during that very strong El Nino event in the winter of 2015. And he showed that the temperatures actually were more than two standard deviations above a constructed normal. Medium. Hello? Yep. Nope, uh, Emily, everything friend, should be fine. I'm not sure what that was. OK, sorry. Yes, it looks, looks good. Thank you. Okay. So Dan Weimont, Dan, Dan Weimont um, constructed a 60-year average, and this extreme temperature was more than two standard deviations above that 60-year average. Studies looking at the ability of that mosquito, Aedes aegypti, to transmit virus, this is called the vectorial capacity, so the ability the climate suitability of that mosquito transmitting Zika and dengue transmission during, right before that Zika epidemic emerged, was at the highest level in the past 60 years. So in other words, the climate suitability made it very favorable for transmission of dengue and Zika virus because Zika is in the same family as dengue. But something else that's unique from laboratory studies of Zika virus, the predicted thermal minimum for Zika transmission is five degrees centigrade warmer than that of dengue fever. So the question is, did, did the extreme hot temperatures have something to do with this brand new emergence or actually resurgence of Zika virus? Of course, it's a complicated story. International travel was involved. But it, it is a question that is out there that did this extreme climate have at least played some role in the emergence of Zika virus. 
So now in my last focus area, I want to look at planetary health and this framework as a key uh, path forward to prevent the next pandemic. Because if, if I paraphrase Alda Leopold, we now vividly realize our own health is inextricably linked to the health of ecosystems. And when you see this recent surge in deforestation in the Amazon just from this year, I question, you know, what, what will that risk be? But I want to show this image. I'm sure that almost all of you have seen these these op-eds and these stories coming out of the silver lining of our current pandemic when the global economy has shut down. And you look at this image from New Delhi, India, and you compare the before and after the pandemic uh, air quality. You now, what could be any clearer comparing today's air quality with business as usual? And remember that air pollution causes 7 million premature deaths every year, according to the World Health Organization. We've seen satellite images of nitrogen dioxide. Um, Dr. Tracy Holloway works on satellite images to detect air pollution, and there are studies around the world. Right now, look at these satellites. This is comparing January from February, nitrogen dioxide over China, just dropping like a stone. Look at this comparison in, in France and other parts of Europe, comparing March of 2019 with March of 2020, looking at you know less nitrogen dioxide in the air. Look at our own country, March 19, uh, uh, March uh, 2019 to March 2020, and look at this from these big mega cities in India. When's the last time that they had a clean, you know, good green air quality rating. So my big question, you know, at this time, this particular time, do we really want to uncork the conventional dangerous fossil fuel economy? Especially when you look at this recent report from the World Health, from uh, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where the IPCC was asked, what would it take to stabilize the Earth's climate at just one and a half degrees centigrade warming and not go beyond that when it becomes quite dangerous for ecosystems and our health? Well, the answer from the IPCC was that to stabilize at one and a, of just one and a half degrees warming, we need to cut our emissions from burning fossil fuels and also from cutting rainforests, but mostly burning fossil fuels. We need to cut emissions 45%. In 10 years and get to net zero by 20 really soon. So this is urgent. And I worry, though, you know, right now with our current pandemic, you know, and shutting down the global economy as a solution, you know, will, will people fear the trade off of solving another global crisis? But Unlike COVID-19, I strongly feel that, you know, combating climate change could be free or even a net gain. I've been on this soapbox for over five years, six years, looks like, uh, publishing on climate change challenges and opportunities for global health. Solving the global climate crisis, the greatest health opportunity of our times just uh, over a month ago, publishing with two former students of ours, a low, carbon, a low carbon future could improve global health and achieve economic benefit. Look at the cost of clean energy. You know, if you were to invest in cleaner energy to avoid emitting one ton of CO2 into the atmosphere, it might cost up to $30. Actually, with uh, Greg Nemitz's recent book on why solar got so cheap, it's probably even less than this. But let's, let's take it at $30 or so to avoid emitting one ton of CO2. Well, every time you burn coal and oil 
you know, you emit not only greenhouse gases, but you also emit dangerous pollutants, fine particles, PM 2.5, sulfur dioxide, other hazardous pollutants that we know harm our health. So for every one ton of CO2 that, it, that you avoid emitting, how fewer, how much less PM 2.5 would be in the air? And when you look at that reduction in, two, in fine particles, what is the health benefit from avoided deaths, hospitalizations, and illness and absenteeism? It, on average, globally, we're talking $200 in health benefit for every ton of CO2 avoided. And I ask policymakers, which number is bigger? And it's so important that we recognize how enormous these health benefits are from clean air, uh, and especially in places other parts of the world that are even more polluted than the United States, even far greater benefits. So the enormity of the opportunity upon us is just incredible. And we need to seize this moment. Um, Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, and now the uh, chair of the elders, uh, along with Dana Reddy, put out this op-ed recently tackling climate change with COVID-19 urgency. And uh, Christiana Figueres of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change um, published this op-ed. We can't lose sight of the climate emergency as we're dealing with COVID-19. And I love this, this image. Um, <laughs> why don't we treat climate change like an infectious disease? Because after all, climate change is a global health emergency. And recognizing this, uh, the Nelson Institute and the Global Health Institute, along with partners uh, across the university, have started a new, pro a new program, the Planetary Health Graduate Scholars Program. As I mentioned, this is joint between the Global Health and the Nelson Institutes. Uh, we just started at the beginning of this year with six uh, graduate students from across the campus and, uh, and their faculty advisors. And just, um, I think it was last week, we announced eight new graduate scholars and their mentors. And this program um, comes from a generous donation from Sarah and Dave Epstein. So we're very appreciative of these donations for this extremely timely uh, program. One other uh, project that we're working on, we are quantifying the health benefits from a low carbon society. Um, project Drawdown is led by uh, John Foley, a former professor here at the Nelson Institute. And um, right now, this is a, a collaboration of three Nelson graduate students. And these funds come from the John P. Holton Chair, along with a new donor from Wisconsin. So we are looking at these environmental solutions and quantifying how, how beneficial they are for our health, deepening the rationale to take these actions. So in conclusion, in the middle of an environmentally linked global pandemic, we have the opportunity of a lifetime to seize the moment for a transformative change. And on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, if not now, when? Thank you very much for atten your attention to this presentation. I hope that you've all found that presentation informative and stimulating to thought. Uh, we have several questions and I'll uh, bring those up on my screen. You can't see those. Uh, and I'm gonna direct the first question to Greg Moses. It's a very straightforward question seemingly. How can we control the coronavirus?
I think, Ashley, that you need to unmute Greg. Greg, can you unmute? Now I think we're good. There you go. Sorry. So how can we control the coronavirus? We can't. We really can't control the virus. That's not the, the problem, really. Uh, to stop the spread, humans must control their personal and collective behavior. The virus is microscopic, and it lives only within human hosts, mostly in the human respiratory cells, and can only spread when two humans are close enough to each other and are not wearing masks that shield the exhaled droplets in their breath from other people. It's just as simple as that. Humans must behave to avoid the spread. When they do not, the number of cases goes up. And this will go on forever unless we individually and collectively behave properly. Thanks, Greg. And now for a question more specific to Bethel, but also a straightforward question. Craig, perhaps you'll take this one. So when will Bethel open? Well, if you mean open in the sense of how we were five months ago, it may be several months away when we have a vaccine and we've immunized lots of people. But before that, we hope we can get back to live worship in a safe and limited way. And that requires us to have some science-based permission to be open. And then the COVID-19 task force has developed quite a good plan for conducting live worship. Well, how about Sunday school? Will we have that this fall? Any chance? Craig? Right. Well, as you know, right now, Sunday school confirmation, almost any kind of group gathering indoors are not happening. Uh, we're having outdoor meetings of these groups. But um, again, when it's time to resume back to live indoor meetings, there's a similar plan worked out to the worship that includes, you know, registration, health and temperature checks when people enter, assigned seating, physical distancing, wearing masks, um, and so there's a lot, there are some very densely detailed plans for both youth programs and worship. So Greg, what's being done to create a safe environment at Bethel? The, um, The safe environment is mostly associated with the process of holding a service, not so much the building itself. And so there has been a task force meeting now for many weeks to try to understand the, all the various problems and implications that are associated with this. And, and, and just, I think today, uh, the recommendations from that task force were presented to the church council. And so um, this will be reported now to the congregation, I think probably within the next several days in, in through a variety of, of venues. And so um, the, the kinds of things we're looking at are the numbers of people that we can put in the sanctuary at one time, um, limiting their interpersonal proximity so that there's very little chance that the um, droplets and, and other emissions, if you will, from one person are, are going to intercept anyone else. There will be universal wearing of masks, uh, frequent cleaning of common surfaces. And so that's one of the particular things that will be done to the actual physical facility in the church. And so all of these things are putting, being put in place uh, all together to try to provide a safe environment for worship. And I joined in. Uh, I just heard that the council did approve the plan from the COVID-19 group. And uh, 
some of the other things we're doing for a safe environment. Access to the building right now is limited. People who enter are registered and checked for health. Um, as Greg said, employees are wearing masks. We've closed off several of the toilets and fountains and shared refrigerators. The food pantry is taking place in the driveway outside the church. And as Greg said, there's a lot more cleaning potential and supplies. Okay, um, this is a question that has uh, implications both for Bethel and uh, beyond. What can Bethel do as a congregation to reduce or fight global warming? You want to take a shot at that, Greg? Well, sure. Um, reduce the combustion of carbonaceous fuels. Well, that would be coal, oil, and natural gas for the most part. I suppose wood comes into there too, but, but for, for the United States at least, I think that's coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, global warming results from the increased concentrations of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, and that creates something called the greenhouse effect, which which we understand because we build greenhouses. And that's the reason why uh, plants can live inside of a greenhouse when the outside environment is uh, perhaps too cold for them because sunlight that penetrates through the glass on the way in uh, can't penetrate in the return direction. And so um, that's what CO2 does in the atmosphere and, and uh, that's what's creating the global warming. And so anything we can do to reduce combustion uh, is going to be a good thing. And one step in that direction is the plan to install solar panels on the administrative part of the building. At Bethel. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. And that, that project is, I think, in a temporary hiatus uh, due to the situation in which we find ourselves. But uh, there is a strong commitment to go ahead with that as rapidly as possible. So carrying on that, that theme, how confident can we be about all this global warming and climate change stuff? Uh, after all, weather predictions are notoriously inaccurate. So I'm uh, gonna ask Greg and then John Kutzbach to offer some comments on that. Well, weather and climate are not, uh, weather and climate predictions are not the same thing. Uh, weather that's of interest to us occurs over usually the next five to 10 days and climate is something that interests us over decades and centuries. And uh, where that's all going is based upon computer simulations and, and one of the world's experts and one of the pioneers in such computer simulations is our own John Kutzbach. And so I think I wanna turn this over to him rather than speaking for him. Thanks, Craig. Uh, <clears throat> you really said the uh, essential thing when you said that a greenhouse lets solar radiation in, but it does not let heat radiation out. That's why it gets warm inside. So this is a matter of physics. And climate models use physics, the laws of uh, thermodynamics and the laws of, of motion to uh, to turn this uh, evidence of the level of carbon dioxide into a very specific forecast for temperature increase. And actually we started doing this in 1970, once we were certain that it was carbon dioxide that was beginning to cause the climate to warm. So we've already been predicting or estimating the climate change due to carbon dioxide for 50 years. And I'm happy to tell you that the forecast or the predictions or the estimates we made 50 years ago are almost exactly what's happened as of 2020. So that's just one example of how we can be really very confident that climate models are giving us good guidance for the future of the climate of the earth. Thank you. And thank you, John. Well, continuing on that theme, uh, how can we help the public connect the dots between environmental degradation, 
uh, public policy choices, and health outcomes in general, including the effects of global warming and pandemics. I'm not sure who wants to take a shot at that one. Well, I'll take a shot, and then okay. <clears throat> Greg and Craig can also uh, chime in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I think uh, education is part of this. It's not detailed education. It's the kind of education we get from Bill and I, the science guy. It's, it's giving the example of how a greenhouse works. Or in the case of environment, it's comparing what a, uh, what a, what a, house, a house that's filled with smoke or a garden that's laced with pesticides these things are going to cause problems. And Jonathan Patz very clearly showed how deforestation and, and, uh, and other things were causing problems for our wildlife. Well, it all fits together. So uh, uh, I actually think that uh, a combination of public service announcements and maybe more announcements in churches could really help spread the word. You know, uh, if you watch TV or radio at all, you know there are an announcements if there's severe weather coming or to tornadoes. Why shouldn't there be announcements about pollution levels, about the dangers of burning fossil fuel, about what deforestation is doing to natural habitats? So I think edu education is a part of this. I'll turn it over to Greg and Craig for more detail. Pretty hard to add to everything you've said. I think one example that might be though, like in schools and middle school level where students would learn more about some of these links between animals and domestic animals and people and some case studies of how that linkage happens, like John talked about today. The, uh, the spillover effect Yes, animal hosts. Uh, to human disease. Is that what you're referring to, Greg? Craig? Yeah. Okay. Greg, did you have anything to add to that? I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, I mean, we sort of share the same planet with all the other countries. And, and the issues that we're speaking of here, uh, cli climate change, which is, is largely the atmosphere, um, doesn't really know any borders and, and neither do these microscopic viruses as we've now learned. And so um, there has to be more collaboration and cooperation among uh, separate political entities or countries to, to help solve these kinds of problems. And so uh, all countries are not at the same stage in their, in their development either. Um, they're so-called first world and second world and third world countries. And and um, I think the first world countries need to take a leadership role in all of this because it's much of the same technology that we created 50 or 60 years ago or longer that has been adopted by the second and third world countries to try to catch up to where we are. And what we're learning is it doesn't really scale very well that if, if uh, 500 million people rely on this, then it's probably acceptable, but when six or seven billion people rely upon it, then uh, it gets out of hand and, and you just can't burn enough coal to keep everyone in China and India um, warm or cool as the case may be. And so we need to find other solutions. I think we need to keep focusing on this concept, one health, there's one world, we're all in it, whatever happens in here or in China or in Africa, eventually affects everyone else. And that includes who gets vaccine shots. We can't just protect our Dane County people by getting the shots. All right. Well, one uh, of the we were touching a moment ago on one of Jonathan Patz's points about the spillover effect um, of disease from animal hosts to humans is there a way uh, to limit unhealthy or dangerous contact with wildlife? Any takers? I think there are attempts to do that in many countries. 
including killing animals for horns. Uh, and so if there's international cooperation and funding, some of that can happen, but it's a tough political battle. Well, I, I'll add that I think it's not, it's not only political, but it's cultural in many uh, respects, uh, whether it's the belief that rhinoceros horn has medicinal effects or pangolin uh, scales, uh, or uh, the uh, traditional markets in, in some countries where uh, there's ready, uh, a ready setting for uh, these uh, disease transmissions to occur. It makes it uh, very difficult indeed uh, and uh, many countries don't like uh, folk from the West coming in and telling the, uh, them how they should uh, regulate their culture uh, any more than they like us telling them how to regulate their economy. There was a question about building modifications at Bethel and uh, currently there's no proposal for major building modifications for the COVID. We have put in a shield over the reception desk and we're doing more cleaning, restricting access to parts of the building, going to do different ways we use the building with uh, one-way paths and assigned seating. But uh, the only one we've had any more serious look at is airflow. And Greg might fill us in on that. Well, yeah, we took a look at airflow in the sanctuary to see if, in fact, there's places that you would sit in the sanctuary that would put you downstream of many other people. Um, and this is not an exact science. We, we used smoke and a very intense flashlight to watch where the smoke goes. And um, what we learned was that throughout most of the sanctuary, it largely just disperses kind of in all directions. And um, interestingly enough, about a half an hour after uh, we were done, uh, in just the sanctuary, I went out into the Emmaus room and took my flashlight into the coat closet where it was nice and dark because the light was off and I could detect smoke in there even though we hadn't put any smoke in there at all. So it just goes to show that these microscopic uh, particles just go everywhere. I mean, uh, and so um, one short of some you know, enormous effort to, to improve the air ventilation system, which I think would be incredibly expensive. Um, I think we have to just uh, watch the scientific understanding of whether there is any real evidence that people are infected by these low concentrations of particles or whether it's really almost entirely direct uh, interaction between one person and another and the um, droplets that one person is emitting as they're, as they're talking or um, mostly talking. Right, it's, there's an open question still as to whether the main mode of transmission of disease is the larger droplets that we tend to emit in a cough or a sneeze or uh, when singing or talking loudly like I am now, uh, or whether they're uh, transmitted by uh, uh, aerosols that are uh, about a hundred times smaller and that can remain suspended uh, in buoyant in the air uh, for a very long period of time. And like your smoke uh, in the uh, example you mentioned, Greg, uh, transmitted perhaps throughout the ventilation system of a building or within a room. It may be of some interest that uh, colleagues uh, of ours at the UW College of Engineering are uh, working on some experiments, uh, some more sophisticated measurements, uh, as well as uh, uh, 3D computer simulations of airflow initially in uh, a classroom because they want to be able to inform the decisions that have to be made on reopening uh, the university for live instruction. Uh, but that may lead to tools that uh, 
down the road can be used to assess uh, the airflow and perhaps uh, virus transmission within other structures. So that uh, pretty much brings us to the end of uh, our intended one hour time together. So I'm gonna say thanks to everyone who has joined us for this event, and especially those who submitted questions and comments. We hope you found the time interesting and informative. If someone you know would have liked to have viewed tonight's event but was unable to, the event has been recorded and will be available later on the Bethel website for viewing after the fact. Thanks likewise to our expert panelists, Craig Jurdy, Greg Moses, and John Kutzbach, and a special word of appreciation to our behind the scenes technical wizards, Ashley Becker and Rob Kolhep for enabling this event. Finally, keep in mind that Bethel's next Caring for Creation Forum on or about October 25th will be with University of Iowa writer Connie Musel speaking on its crisis time for global warming and the environment. So good night and may good health and the peace of Christ be with us all. Thanks.